Good afternoon. It's the 14th day of April 2021. And today's video is going to be I'm, I'm getting a lot of requests about what you know what I think about uh, various entry level type of uh, jobs. What would be a good entry level criminal investigator position that could prepare you for another agency? Well, today's presentation is going to be on uh, if you don't know, each of the military services in large has their own investigative component, their own criminal investigators, their own special agents. The Army has their own, the Navy and Marine Corps has one, which is the NCIS, and the Air Force has their own. And today I'm going to talk about the Army's, and that is, it's, it's a long name, the Army Criminal Investigation Division Command, I'm just going to call it CID. Criminal Investigation Division because it's a mouthful. Uh, it's like I call it DEA, you know, DEA instead of Drug Enforcement Administration because it's a mouthful. So CID is the Army's special agents, and they work felony cases. They do investigations, felony investigations of cases that pertain to the United States Army. Now there'll be largely two types of people that come within their investigative purview. And those would be number one, the biggest ones would be contractors or you know civilians who commit crime on base. But contractors, that would be your biggest non-military people that you would come in contact with. And then people who are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now for those of you who don't know, the UCMJ is a body of law that deals with servicemen and women on active duty. So if you're on active duty, you're subject to the UCMJ Congress. The Constitution allows the Congress to enact laws that govern the Army and the Navy, and that's what they did with the UCMJ. So there's very, the UCMJ is a very different body of law than federal criminal law, okay? But both could be applicable, and the special agents of the Criminal Investigation Division of the Army have authority under both sets of laws, okay? So there, it's all federal law, but you could go through the Title 18 United States Code or Title 21 United States Code, which is regular criminal law. You could bring a case in U.S. District Court, just like DEA or FBI or IRS. When we arrest somebody, we take them to, you know, the other branch of government, the judicial branch of government, and there's a grand jury and it's tried before a federal judge. Or you could take them, if they're military personnel, uh, through the military justice system, in which event it's a lot different. Okay, the commanding general has almost plenary authority as to whether to charge, how to charge, and what level of tribunal or non-judicial punishment to give. Now, this sounds like maybe a lot of gobbledygook if you're not in the military, but and basically a court-martial is a military trial. Okay, now what are some of the cases, famous cases, that CID has investigated? Um, for those of you who remember, probably don't want to remember, but you're probably old enough to remember, uh, going back to the early times when we invaded Iraq, this is 2004, 2005, there was the Abu Ghraib scandal. Now, what is the Abu Ghraib scandal? It was a bunch of, it was an army reservist unit that was called to active duty and they were assigned custody duty in Abu Ghraib, which was an Iraqi prison that had been one of Saddam's prisons, but they turned it into a detainee center. And CID agents were doing in interrogations, as well as contractors were doing interrogations, but they had this group of soldiers on midnight shift who, um, um, you know, some of them were prison guards and really did, went, you know, beyond the pale. I mean, just totally inhumane treatment. They actually killed a guy. And, you know, in, in keeping with the modern day people who can't keep their hands away from their phones, they actually r took pictures of this, if you can believe it, and shared the pictures. And of course, before long, they all got court-martialed and uh, a lot of them got sent to U.S. Disciplinary Barracks Leavenworth. Now, who did the investigation that would fall to CID? Okay, because it's a combat zone, military personnel subject to the UCMJ. That's who does the investigation. So here you have, you know, a bona fide, as far as I'm concerned, a bona fide war crime, and they investigated it, prosecuted these knuckleheads, and um, they got their just desserts. Another case that you may be aware of, this is a crime on base. 
but it involved, again, a man who was subject to the UCMJ, and that is the Fort Hood shooting. You know, Nidal Hassan was a, a major in the army, a psychiatrist of all things. He then decided to go on a jihad rampage and he shot up the place, killed a bunch of soldiers. Uh, a Department of Defense uh, civilian police officer shot him in the spine. Uh, he survived. Uh, CID conducted the investigation along with the FBI, okay, along with the FBI. And we're going to get into this in a minute, why the FBI has to come in in a lot of cases. But Hassan was convicted and sentenced to death, and he is now on the U.S. disciplinary barracks death row, but in a wheelchair because uh, he was heroically shot by, again, a Department of Defense civilian police officer. A third case, and this one is very, very interesting. This is the most interesting case I've ever heard in my life. It involves CID. This is actually a case where, you know, all three of those cases where CID was on God's side, I think. But on this case, you know, the side of the angels. Really weird case. It goes back to 1985, and it involved, a, at the time, a specialist for at the 82nd Airborne Division named Tim Hennis. H-E-N-N-I-S. And you can look this up if you want to find out about it. It's just an interesting thing, you know. And what happened is um, Hennis was a, assigned to the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg. And living off base was uh, an Air Force captain, uh, the Eastburn family. And Mr. Or Captain Eastburn was TDY to another Air Force base going through some training. But they had orders. To, it was Germany. And... They had orders, but they couldn't take the family dog. Okay, this being 1985, they put in a classified ad because they figured a higher class person will answer a classified ad. They want someone who would take care of the dog. Well, of course, uh, specialist for Hennis is a wife and child, and he wants to have a dog adopt the dog. So he goes over to the house, takes the dog home. Okay. Well, not long afterward, uh, the next couple of days, the husband's calling, no answer. The neighbor notices the newspapers are piling up. So they call the police and they see a, hear a baby crying inside. So they do an emergency entry, find a child who is starving and been without food or water for a couple of days. They take care of that child. But then they find Mrs. Eastman, who has been raped and had her throat cut, and two children who have had their throats cut. Okay. Gruesome crime scene. So what do the police do? This is the local cops. What do they do? They don't know where, really where to start, but they know that they had put an ad out for someone to adopt the dog. They start interviewing neighbors, and they said, well, at, late at night we saw a guy who was blonde, blue-eyed with a mustache, driving a Chevette. So they put this out, and specialist for Hennis uh, drives to the Fayetteville sheriff's office and gives an interview and he also gives hair blood and semen samples okay uh, but based on the eyewitness testimony they arrest Hennis okay and he is charged in court but he isn't discharged from the army he's in jail he eventually bails out uh, but his trial comes up in July of 1986 and he's convicted and sentenced to die by the state of North Carolina and shipped off to death row. Now he is still in the army. He is because his case is on appeal. Uh, his case goes up through the appeals court process and the North Carolina Supreme Court rules that the photographs introduced at the trial were so prejudicial that they reverse his conviction, send it down for retrial. He has a very good defense on retrial and he's acquitted. And they actually make a made-for-TV movie about him. He goes back to the Army and says, uh, I, want, I want to stay in the Army. So the Army promotes him to Staff Sergeant for the time that he was in jail. He gets full back pay for the time he was in jail. He was never separated from the Army. And he re-enlists. And he stays in the Army until 2004. And he retires as a Master Sergeant. Okay. Now in 2006... They still have this guy's samples, and they still have the swab that's taken from Mrs. Eastman's body. This may gross you out a little bit. This is what happens, okay? And they say, well, we have new technology now that we didn't have in the 1980s. We have DNA, okay? 
So they submit the swab that was taken from Miss Eastman's body, along with the known samples from Hennis. Now, why these weren't destroyed, I have no clue, but they weren't. CID sends them in, and it comes back as a positive match to Tim Hennis, who had been acquitted. So what did they do? Well, I can't try him again in North Carolina. That's double jeopardy. He's already been acquitted. But the Army, can they try him? Well, in 1985, they couldn't because a crime had to be service-connected. But since then, those of you who know the UCMJ, they changed, the Supreme Court changed, said that no, service members are really subject to the UCMJ 24-7, even if they're off base, even if the crime really doesn't have a service connection, they can try him. So they received permission from the Department of the Army, Secretary of the Army, they recalled Master Sergeant Hennis to active duty to stand a general court-martial at Fort Bragg for murdering this woman and her two children. And after several years of legal wrangling, he was convicted at general court-martial and sentenced to death, and now he's on death row at the U.S. Disciplinary Barracks at Leavenworth. Okay, so it's an odd case. Um, his defense was, and this is only possible defense, is that he and Miss Eastman did engage in consensual relations, which he did not want to admit to at the first trial so as not to besmirch her uh, reputation, but it didn't look good. So the, the military jury convicted him unanimously and sentenced him to die. And it looks like that's case that execution, unless the current administration doesn't want to carry it out. Probably be the first military execution that's been carried out since 1961. So uh, it's interesting, interesting stuff. Now, what does it take to join the CID? Well, they have two types of investigators, military and civilian. Military, they're all enlisted. So that's a difference from the NCIS and other branches. You have to be enlisted to do this. Now, you can do this from in the Army, inside the Army, or you can enlist in the Army if you're a college graduate with certain degrees. You have a degree in criminal justice, biology, uh, computer science, accounting, you can enlist in the army. Now I'm not an army recruiter, so don't. And they will, you can enlist with the guarantee of going to, after basic training, you go to military police school and then CID agent school. And I'm gonna put up the requirements for this. And uh, it's something that you and the Army recruiter work out, but it's a guarantee if you have a four-year college degree. And then you enter the ranks of the Criminal Investigation Division as an enlisted special agent, and presumably you serve four years. Now, what would be the benefits of this? Well, you'd get the opportunity to deploy, which would give you a five-point preference, plus you get special agent experience. The other way to join is as a civilian, which has a 37-year-old, 37 you know, it's the same cutoff date as any federal law enforcement agency, but they are looking for primarily contract fraud specialists, computer specialists, and polygraphers, okay? That's what they really need. Because again, when you have contract fraud, um, your average enlisted soldier is incapable of, or trained to really look at that. They work very closely with the FBI and if it's serious contract fraud, the FBI is going to get it. If it's a serious, like in the Nid al-Hassan murders, the FBI did a lot of the work, although the CID is technically the lead agency. Now, why is it that the FBI gets a lot of this? Again, the pros and cons. Okay, what are some of the cons? Well, a lot of your work as an enlisted special agent is gonna be protective work. Protective for who? Well, the Secretary of the Army, all of these generals, they get protective details, okay? So you're gonna be doing some of that. You're gonna be doing hey you work. Hey you work is come here. We need this, we need that. The second type of work, if you look at the Court of Appeals of the Armed Forces, what kind of court marshals make it to the very top? And the Court of Appeals is the highest military court. And one thing you're gonna notice is sex, sex, and more sex. Unfortunately, a lot of the cases that make it to the high level, the highest appellate review level, involve sexual misconduct, sexual harassment. And who do you think gets to investigate those cases where you have two drunken service members 
uh, and you have to put together what happened. Well, CID gets to do that. So while you'll do some, you have the opportunity to work some cool cases, maybe a lot of what you're gonna be doing as an enlisted CID member is he said, she said, uh, and if you, I'm gonna put the, the link up there in some of these cases, you can just look at them. I mean, that's what, that's what they get prosecuted for nowadays. Now, when I was in the military, we had better criminals, you know. It becomes like a college campus kind of environment. Um, so as a member of CID, that's the downside. You're gonna be doing a lot of these cases that would never see the light of day in a civilian world, but on a college campus or a military base are big deals. In our top story tonight, Congress dove into a litany of problems exposed by the Fort Hood Independent Review yesterday. And while some of those problems were with the investigations happening at the post, Congress is also concerned about what's happening to soldiers off post. Six News reporter Andrew Moore looked into why there have been problems handling investigations involving service members outside Fort Hood and what needs to be changed. The top commander of the Army Criminal Intelligence Division told Congress they will... It's actually CID, Criminal Investigation Division, but we'll let them pass. ...better investigate cases involving soldiers that happen outside Fort Hood. This after Congress says many of those cases were not fully investigated. Uh, the case file review also revealed that outpost suicides and deaths were not fully investigated by CID. The Fort Hood Review states off post suicides and deaths were not fully investigated by CID to determine whether there were contributory causes such as lifestyle issues, locations or other influences that would inform the command about certain activity, people and places off post that may be higher risk for their soldiers. When Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia questioned the Army CID commander, she was assured this was not what the Army intended. That is not, uh, uh, that is not typical. So if a suicide or a case happens off the installation, we do a collaborative investigation with the local law enforcement. So why didn't that happen at Fort Hood? Well, it seems to do that, Fort Hood needs 1811 civilian investigators that can go off post. Right now, it's not clear if Fort Hood has them or not. Congressman Garcia also said it seemed like Fort Hood and local law enforcement did not work well together. As the chairwoman again pointed out, there didn't seem to be a lot of cooperation. So is that being addressed? So at Fort Hood, one of the things that our, our agents are doing is participating in this criminal fusion um, initiative that's being running at the installation. We are improving our relationship with local state law enforcement. Unfortunately, here's the rub. I mean, uh, service members, active duty, have no arrest authority, essentially, with regards to civilians. Uh, that's the Posse Comitatus Act, unless you have martial law. So you have to have civilian investigators or the local police do it. Uh, they can collaborate, they can ask the police to do something, but active duty personnel Really, once something is off post, you know, they don't have any authority whatsoever. Uh, because again, military personnel cannot be used to enforce civilian laws off base. Lee Commander Donna Martin did not clarify what that criminal intelligence fusion initiative will look like. And while Colleen PD did confirm they have a new military liaison to help share intelligence with Fort Hood, a lot of specifics have not yet been hashed out. And at the end of our 6 p.m., we told you we would compare notes from Colleen PD and Fort Hood on what this new program would look like. But we can't do that because Fort Hood never sent their notes. They do say we will be able to talk to them directly about this new program tomorrow. So we'll keep you posted. Andrew Moore, 6 News. All right, you can read. So hopefully this has been a little bit helpful, giving you the pros and cons of CID, what kind of work they do, some of the interesting cases, some of the not so interesting stuff. So um, the next one will be on the NCIS and what they do, which isn't a whole lot different from what um, the CID does. Okay, thanks.